Good morning and welcome to the Linus Wear Earth's Investor Briefing for the 2023 financial year. Today's presentation will be presented by Amanda Lacaz, CEO and Managing Director. And joining Amanda will be Gardin Sturzenegger, CFO, Daniel Havas, VP of Strategy and Investor Relations, and Sarah Leonard, General Counsel and Company Secretary. I'll now hand over to Amanda. Please go ahead, Amanda. Thanks, Jen. Um, good morning, everybody. And as always, um, thank you for joining us today as we talk about our results. Um, I'm sure that many of you will have already read all of the material which has been uploaded to the ASX and you will see that in the year that's just passed, we've had some highlights and, you know, we've had some lowlights. Um, I'm sure there are many questions, but before I take those questions, let me speak a little bit to some of the highlights and lowlights. Um, you will have seen that we've described this as a productive year and uh, for anyone who's ever done any releases of any sort, you would know that we spend quite a lot of time thinking about what's really just the right way to describe the year that was. And so we feel that productive is a very good description. Operationally, um, we had a very productive year, uh, but we also made significant progress on our investments for the future. If we look first of all at our operating performance, it was indeed a highlight. Uh, in a year of two halves, in the first half we had lower production, significantly affected by, it seems like a, 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 an ancient memory now, but the, the water challenges that we had in Malaysia when there was the huge burst water line um, and higher prices. In the second half of the year, we had record production outcomes um, in an environment with lower prices. And the outcome of that was that our second half revenue and profit was pretty much equal to our first half, despite the significantly lower prices in the market. And that really demonstrates the strength that we have from our operating base and our experience. Mount World, performed extremely well throughout the year with record production. That's really important because it meant that Mount Weld was able to not only feed our Quantan facility, but also to build a stockpile for the startup of the Kalgoorlie Rare Earths Processing Facility. And if, as we indeed fervently hope, you know, we are in the near future operating two plants, then um, you know, this, this bodes very well for us to be able to feed those two plants. In Malaysia, the water problems um, have been put to bed for now. And um, we saw in the second half of the year when there were none of those external uh, factors actually reducing availability that we were able to record uh, record production quarter on quarter um, with uh, 1,860 tonnes in the final quarter, which was really an outstanding result. Now our focus uh, turns to really continuing to optimise and improve uh, the efficiency of both operations so that we can ensure that we protect our ability to succeed even when market dynamics are less favourable. As we then look to preparing for the future, well, yes, there are many highlights and, and some lowlights. We have a very ambitious growth program. Uh, with our first large-scale projects since Mount Weld and Kwantan were constructed a decade ago. And so the projects have been ongoing on each of the sites. So the growth at uh, the growth program at Mount Weld, the very large installation that we're constructing in Kalgoorlie, and of course, additional work in Malaysia to ensure that it is prepared to receive the mixed rare earth carbonate from our Kalgoorlie rare earths processing facility. 
At Mount Weld, we continued our drilling program and it's a program in two parts. So we are drilling out the ore body to improve our understanding of um, the current uh, deposit and to undertake a proper update of our resource and reserve statement. Uh, in addition, we have the true exploration program as we move further into uh, the carbonatite to truly understand material there, its economic uh, profile and the ability for that to once again give us um, an opportunity to, to revise uh, our mine life. Our capacity expansion at Mount Weld is on track and in the presentation uh, we've included some photos um, from July which actually show major earthworks, a significant amount of the concrete actually poured and this is all in line with the early works approvals that we have received. In Kalgoorlie we have highlights and lowlights. Um, we are on the home stretch to completion of this facility. Only the waste gas treatment plant um, is still ongoing in terms of final construction. During the progress of this project, we have solved for a number of difficult issues. For example, um, you know, we have not been able to get our gas come down the pipeline. We've had to make uh, uh, changes to, to our project to have on-site gas. Um, we face some issues with things like, for example, how the earth compacted as we were doing our, our dams associated with the facility. And we have taken the opportunity as we've moved through the project to progressively improve some elements of the design, um, some for safety and uh, some for capacity. Uh, the, the outcome is that today, and this is definitely a highlight, is that we're able to announce that we have a 30%, approximately 30% uplift in nameplate capacity to about 9,000 tonnes per annum. Um, the low light, of course, is our announcement on a further increase in the cost to complete. Um, I know that you are all very much across the issues with cost inflation on projects in Western Australia. Um, we're not Robinson Crusoe as far as this is concerned. Uh, we certainly went into this um, with a great optimism that by putting certain controls and strategies in place, we would be able to avoid some of those, um, you know, sort of general price um, cost, cost pressures. And indeed, uh, I think we have done so relatively successfully in some areas. Um, but the key for really why we're now, as we come into the home stretch, looking at um, a further uplift in our forecast cost to complete is really our compressed timeline. I think as everyone knows, the project has always been scheduled to meet an arbitrary timeline um, determined by the Malaysian operating license. Um, that's been further exacerbated by some of our early challenges, for example, getting final approvals um, which was you know, later than in our original project schedule. And that's seen us having to backload our work schedule. I've spoken before about running some areas of the construction on a 24 seven basis. And I think everybody knows that that doesn't come free of cost penalty. The license variation, which was announced in um, May, gave us some relief, but it's still a very challenging timeline and we've had to apply significantly more resources as we approach completion. As detailed, we expect it will now be approximately 730 million. That's on a like for like basis versus our original forecast for this project but it will give us an approximately 9,000 tonne per annum capacity compared to the originally um, envisaged uh, 7,000 tonne per annum capacity. And the delay in startup leads to us having to capitalise some additional commissioning and pre-commissioning costs. 
Um, we've put our operating team in place um, ahead of a forecast um, startup. And uh, whilst they are very, very productively utilised in the commissioning process, that does see us having to uh, capitalise some of those costs. But I guess in, in, in you know, sort of summary, this is a really significant facility. It is the first of its type in Australia and we have designed it for growth. Today we're announcing the um, uplift in nameplate capacity, um, but we actually have designed this facility in a way that gives us the opportunity to both grow capacity and also grow activity. So it truly is a foundational investment and um, you know, we think it is an investment very well made. Of course, the other exciting um, news on, on uh, our growth projects is in the US, um, which is referenced in, this, in today's outcome as a subsequent event, but I think you're all very much across that. The new contract that we signed and announced earlier this month is a cost recovery um, the contract, which shows the US government's commitment to completing this task. In Malaysia, and you'll see the, pho the photos in, in the presentation, um, we have done significant works to ensure that we can receive and process the mixed rare earth carbonate from Kalgoorlie. And we have taken the opportunity there to put in some additional uh, capability, uh, for example, soda ash um, receival and, and, and management and some other actions which will contribute to our continuing um, cost efficiency on that site. On the Malaysian licence, we do continue to engage uh, generally very productively, I think, with both uh, federal and state governments in Malaysia on the importance of the rare earths processing industry as a source of growth for the Malaysian economy and the importance of Linus operations as part of that. And I really would encourage you all to click through onto YouTube and see um, the uh, you know, 10 years in Malaysia ad, ad campaign that we've got um, airing on television and also online at present. Of course, the other thing which is included within the report and which is a matter that I know all investors are interested in as well as, you know, sort of what we're doing in terms of ESG. We have a very strong culture and commitment to each of the E, the S and the G. Um, and I think that it's really important, quite often there's a lot written on ESG governance as if it is something which is forced from the outside in onto organisations. In our case, um, this is not an external con condition, but an internal drive. Our people are absolutely driven by their commitment, not just to our communities, but also to ensuring that we run operations which are safe and environmentally sustainable. Whether it's environmental issue, environmental initiatives, for example, um, tree planting in Kalgoorlie, educational initiatives, back to school program in Kwantan, solar kits for um, you know, primary age children in Kalgoorlie, uh, sports like our wonderful sports carnival that we have each year in Kwantan. One year my husband tried to teach um, the soccer mad locals how to kick an AFL footy. Um, that was sort of interesting and had um, some spotty success or just making sure that our people are front and centre in our volunteering activities. It is our people who drive our commitment and our culture to meet what is expected by the external world in terms of ESG. And we do it because it is the right thing to do. So, as I said at the beginning, we see this as having been a very productive year. Um, we are now facing into a transition year as we look at, you know, um, we have a couple of different scenarios, but the current one is one where we get Kalgoorlie 
um, up and running and then we transitioned to that as the feedstock for our downstream operations in Malaysia. Um, continuing work at Mount World and also commencing the project in the US. And this is all about ensuring that we are match fit for the future because we have absolutely um, no, no concerns at all about the fact that this market is going to continue in to grow in value and in demand. And we need to make sure that we are ready for the next year when the market dynamics are as positive as they were last year. So with that, um, I'm very happy to take any questions. And our first question will come from Chen Zhang of Bank of America. Your line is open. Good morning, Amanda. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, a few from me, please. Um, firstly, on Kalguri nameplate, uh, 9,000 ton per annum, uh, but um, Linus' target is to achieve 12,000 per annum by FY24, uh, sorry, FY25. Um, I'm just wondering what's the contingency plan where the license condition from Malaysia um, is unsuccessful and how should we think of Kalguri additional capex required and timeline um, to produce 12,000 ton per annum of NDPR? Thank you. I have another, um, I have two more after this. Thank you. Um, so, yes, um, this is a very good question and we, we continue to fit the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together um, in terms of ensuring that we have uh, each of the different stages of production aligned. Um, as we look at uh, you know, each of these uh, capacity growth initiatives, we look at what is the optimum uh, step in the first instance. So, for example, as we think about moving through from, you know, the current sort of 7,000 tonnes up to, say, the 12,000 tonnes, um, we could have said, oh, well, at Mount Weld, we'll just go to, say, 10 in the first instance. But, but it, it, project planning, design and efficiency said best to go to the 12. In terms of the Kalgoorlie facility, our first... Um, milestone was that we needed to make sure on a risk management basis that we were able to at least replace what we did in Malaysia. But as the project has progressed, we've actually made decisions and we've disclosed those previously to allow us to confidently provide the um, target uplift in nameplate capacity. Now, further investment in that whilst we are still in ongoing discussions with um, the regulator in Malaysia, we feel would not be prudent. Um, however, as I indicated, the Kalgoorlie facility is, you know, sort of a really substantial foundational facility, which gives us room to grow both in terms of capacity and, and, and activity. Um, but we're not in a position to disclose specifically how that would operate today, but we are in a position to disclose the 9,000 tonnes per annum. Sure, thanks. And um, thanks for that, Amanda. Um, another one, Kalguri again, um, the CAPEX increased to 730 million. Um, I'm wondering if you can provide any colour, how much is due to um, inflation and how much is due to additional cost. You mentioned, um, you know, the additional cost incurred to accelerate the schedule in order to meet the deadline by the Malaysian operating license. Thank you. Um, so the, 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 the major portion is associated with uh, increased um, resources to meet the schedule. Right. Thank, okay. Thanks. And 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 how should we think about the um, operating cost in FY24 um, at Kalguli, which is still early stage? Um, understand labour and utility costs will be higher versus um, you operate from Malaysia. Is there any indication what expected like like for like, such as your chemical re reagents cost from Kalguli versus what was achieved in Malaysia? Thank you. 
Yeah, so we, we haven't disclosed that at this stage because there is a lot, you know, that goes on as we actually go through the commissioning process. Um, but as we think about inputs like um, reagents, for example, what we find is that, you know, the, the price of the price we, we're able to get very close to the inputs in um uh, in Malaysia, but we are still working on optimising logistics because landside logistics in Australia are really quite expensive and that does give us a cost penalty on those elements. Um, as I said, we're very focused across all three sites on continuing to drive down costs to ensure that we can be successful. It will be um, some time before we're able to really be definitive on the uh, cost structure in, in um, Kalgoorlie because, of course, in the ramp-up phase, there's going to be significant um, penalties associated with that ramp-up phase. Um, we know what is the theoretical gap today um, between you know, sort of a, a, a plant which has been operating for 10 years in, in Kwantan and has been optimised on several occasions through that versus a startup plant in Kalgoorlie. But it would be misleading to, you know, sort of use those as being the basis for ongoing operations. Um, so, so we're working on it. But I think that it'll take us about six months after after the plant's been started before we would be able to give any you know, sort of reasonable guidance on what we think the, 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 the medium term stable operating costs are going to be. Sure, sure. Thanks, Amanda. I'll pass it on. Thank you. Thanks, Jenga. And one moment for our next question. Our next question will be coming from Levi Spry of UBS. Your line is open, Levi. Uh, yeah, good morning, Amanda. Thank you. Thank you for your, your time and the call. Uh, some good questions there already. So just on Kalgoorlie, uh, when we think about the $50 million of uh, capitalised operating costs, can you talk to some of the assumptions that are behind that? Uh, I guess the main one being time, but uh, and also how, you know, how long uh, you're capitalising them uh, to what rate of, um, of main plate capacity, I guess? Sure. So those, a, a number of those costs have already been, actually, you know, when we do our quarterly reports with cash flow, I mean, a, a substantial, substantive part of that, about 60% of it, has already been expended. And as we've indicated in the announcement, that includes, you know, we have close to a full operating team, We've sent many of them to Malaysia for, um, for for training. We've had a lot of work. You know, we've actually had to do all of the work on, you know, sort of operating manuals and all of those sorts of things. Um, and that team is, in fact, assisting in the, the, the commissioning process. Um, we also have first fill um, has been completed. So we have soda ash in the soda ash silos and we have um, gas in the LPG bullet and we have, I think we have some acid in, in the sulfuric acid. We clearly have water and a whole series of those sorts of things, which if we had uh, commenced earlier, um, would have already, uh, you know, sort of converted, but you know, accounting principles being as they are, it says that these act, these um, expenses will be capitalised un until um, the plant commences uh, operation of its purpose or words to that effect. Um, so we retain, um, you know, sort of our target date of end of September, but we clearly in providing this, um, you know, sort of guidance have, you know, sort of allowed some buffer, but, um, you know, really it is about um, ensuring that we don't have to come back and give you a different set of numbers. Uh, okay, thank you. So still on track, so end of September, 
uh, and and all of the costs are now included to to make make that happen. Um, yes. Okay. Thank you. And and then just thinking about the the mine, I guess. Um, can you can you just remind me what the what the capital estimate was for that, and and I guess what stage that that is at. So how much is left? Sure. So in terms of the processing facility at Mount Weld, the uh, forecast total project cost is about 500 mil. Um, we're still waiting for the final um, life of mine approvals, which actually encompass our ability to put some of the uh, um, activities which are part of the expansion outside of our current disturbance footprint. And so the works which have been undertaken to date are the early works in accordance with EPA approvals. So that includes the bulk earth works. It also includes um, a, a you know, sort of fair bit of concrete already being poured and we have started the and we you know, uh, lodged lodged um, orders for long lead time items now almost twelve months ago, um, particularly for our, our filter press our filter building um, because it's a more remote site in Kalgoorlie. When we did similar things, we we constructed on site. Um, at Mount Weld, we're doing a lot of modular work off site, which we will then bring on site for um, construction. So um, it is part of, uh, in the um, financial report, we've indicated that we expect an FY24. We've got about 600 million in capital will be spent and the um, remaining and and we expect that we will cover within that a lot of Mount Weld, although it will go through to the end of calendar year FY24. Thanks, Amanda. That was great. Thank you. Thanks, Lee. Bye. And one moment for our next question. Our next question will be coming from David Deckelbaum of TD Cohen. David, your line's open. Good morning, Amanda and team. Thanks for the time this morning. Hi, David. Hello. Um, I wanted to just ask a question just to clarify on the capacity uplift at Kalgoorlie. Um, you know, when, when you all gave a project update in October, I think you said that you were upgrading equipment and you had increased the budget at that point. By say fifty million or so, or seventy-five million or so. Um, now, now I guess the update is we're at nine thousand tons of capacity. I guess could you could you give some color? Of, was was nine thousand tons per annum always the number that you were just risking around? Or and as you get closer, you just have more confidence around this? Or has something happened with the compressed timeline that you're you're adding extra dollars to accelerate that capacity expansion? Uh, no, um, uh, sorry, I shouldn't say no. Option A is more the point. So when we started off, we looked at this and we said, um, and, and yeah, our project director sort of has, says famously, you only get one chance to be at the bottom of the cost curve and that's when you construct. And so, you know, as we specified equipment right from the beginning, we specified it with a keen eye on the fact that we, whilst we needed to have a schedule that saw us be able to replace um, the Malaysian capacity, that we face into a growing market. And so therefore having a, a facility which is able to grow in terms of capacity is really important. Um, so, in some of the initial equipment specification, we certainly had our eye on this ability to be able to upsize the facility. When we made the um, update last October, we had identified additional areas where we needed to make additional investments to be able to support that. And then, just as you've said, David, as we've got closer to it and we've got the facilities in place, we have now, um, 
uh, the confidence level to speak to that being the nameplate where, um, you know, when we started the project, it was an option. I appreciate that. Um, that's, that's helpful color. Um, I guess this, the follow-up for me in that context is the, the 500 million anticipated spend for the Mountain Weld expansion, you know, given that that estimate is about a year old at this point, how do you think about like the contingency around that budget, or is that easier for you to control on the upstream side and have confidence around when you're not racing towards a deadline? Um, yes, your second point is is certainly relevant. I mean, we don't have a requirement there racing towards the deadline to just you know sort of um, put additional raises resources on it, have more crews, uh, you know, deal with some of the contractor management issues in the way that we've been required to deal with them. Um, it's also a brownfield site. And so therefore, uh, we we face a different set of, of challenges, but we have a much greater familiarity with what we're doing. Um, in phase one, so we think of you know sort of phase one, which is this early works phase, and then phase two, we have had some draw on the um, on the contingency. However, we still have contingency headroom, but the team is currently conducting a a, a further cost review on that as well. Um, to see whether there's going to be any further changes, but it is quite a different set of challenges associated with that project compared to the project in Kalgoorlie. If I could just sneak, do you, do you know when that cost review will be completed by? Soon. Fair enough, thank you. <laughs> One moment for our next question. And our next question will come from Austin Young of Macquarie. Austin, your line is open. Uh, morning, uh, Amanda and the team. Uh, my first question was also on Kaguli project. Uh, just wondering for the remaining capital and also the uh, commissioning cost at Kaguli, how much of the spend has been locked in? As we all know that inflation remains quite sticky um, for the next few months or in the very near term. Thank you. Um. We've spent a lot of time pulling this to pieces and understanding exactly what sits in outstanding purchase orders, um, what sits within uh, uh, what we think will be um, claims from contractors and what we see as further costs to completion. So um, the amount which is still at an estimated rather than at an actual level is uh, quite small within that overall number. I mean, I, I think everyone would expect that. Uh, we're a month or so out. Um, so if we didn't know actually what the costs were now, then um, that would be problematic. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Amanda. And just, uh, the second one is on the the grant received during the year, which was uh, 15 um, million. Wondering if you could provide some color on that and how to think about that grant um, for the next 12 months. Thank you. Uh, so the grant money's just come back in as we actually complete. The grant money at Kalgoorlie was specifically related to one um, process element, which was the carbonation circuit and um, a novel flow sheet, which we're implementing there, which I'm not going to share with the world at large, um, but which is, you know, th this was uh, granted under a scheme which was for um, novel development, uh, you know, new initiatives in, in Australia. So um, we s simply claim that back. And at this stage, I think that we've received about 10 million out of the 14.9 million or thereabouts. Thank you, Amanda. Thanks, Austin. One moment for our next question. Yeah. 
And our next question will come from Paul Young of Goldman Sachs. Your line is open, Paul. Hi, Amanda. Good morning. Hope you're well. Um, Amanda, I'm, I'm trying to figure out now with this capex increase at Kalgoorlie what the you know, total capital outlay could be for Linus 2025 uh, to achieve the, the 12,000 tonnes. So we have the, the 780 on Cal, the, the 500 as it stands today and on Mount Weldon. You previously sort of outlaid some, you know, indicated a uh, modest sort of capital to expand LAMP. And then we have, you know, possible debottlenecking or Branfield capex for Cal and cracking and leaching and and, uh, and also possible capex for the light earth refinery in the US. So, and I know you're probably trying to figure out this as well as it stands based on the options, but do you get a sense of what the total capital will be to achieve Linus 2025? So we have given guidance within the, um, or, or an indication within the financial reports uh, under capital commitments, where we've um, affirmed um, a, an expectation that we will spend uh, 600 mil in the year um, ahead. And um, we have not provided further um, data on the following year, but um, we will, but, you know, this year still includes um, Kalgoorlie, it includes, you know, sort of the bulk of Mount World, it includes the LAMP, um, uh, you know, sort of activities at the LAMP as you've identified. Um, we've disclosed previously that our share of the light rare earths in the US is about 30 million US. I expect that that will come into FY25 um, or maybe at the very back end of FY24, but we expect it's about 600 mil this year and it will be something less than that the following year. Okay, uh, thanks, Amanda. And then maybe just switching to the US, I mean, um, great update on the, I guess, uh, on the US um, Department of Defence uh, funding, additional funding associated with the heavy earth plant. Just curious around the, the heavy earth plant and uh, have you thought through um, um, around uh, will you go downstream steps five and six of the value chain? Will you look at metallization and magnets partnerships there? And how, do, how should we think about, you know, the government's involvement and underpinning a, you know, a floor price on the, on the heavy, on, on heavy, on the heavy earths? Um, so in terms of um, downstream, I, 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 Paul, it's a really good question because I think that, you know, um, I, this, this vision to be mind to magnet is um, actually been around. Paul's not joining us today because he's got some visitors on site in WA. But um, he sometimes says to me, the first time he saw a PowerPoint slide talking about mind to magnet was in, I think, 1999. Um, yet we have not achieved it outside of China um, today. And so there are reasons for this. Um, the competencies at each of the stages are actually quite different. And it's very easy to say, well, let's just do X or let's just do Y. But frankly, what you need to know and be good at to be good at mining is different from what you need to know and be good at to be good at the chemical processing step, which is essentially what we do, uh, will be doing in Kalgoorlie and what we do in Malaysia. And then metallization and, and, and magnet making um, bring in a different set of skills fundamentally from you know you you you, you from from what you've got um, in in your chemical processing area so it is absolutely the sort of thing that you can't just wake up one day and say I'm going to be doing this you need to look for good partners skilled partners people with the right sort of technical knowledge and expertise in those areas what we have done in the US is that we have selected a site where we will be able to accommodate both, um, you know, further downstream activity and recycling activity. You know, if you ha have a magnet factory, you need to be able to recycle your swath and um, it's unstable, so you can't be shipping it long distances and those sorts of things. So we see this as a real opportunity and we are engaging with, you know, sort of relevant potential partners, um, which may be a partnership which goes anywhere from supplier, uh, customer partnership through to 
um, some sort of a joint venture and we're, we, we are actively engaged in, in that process as we speak. The success of developing an outside China industry is important for all of us. And, you know, so sometimes um, I think that the, the desire to set up um, outside China operators as if they're, you know, sort of competing with each other when in fact the main game is China. Right, that is our competition. For the rest of us, our success is going to be about building this outside China industry. Otherwise, we simply produce material that ends up going into China for finishing and further value adding. So I think that we do need to work together in this area and we are certainly very focused on engaging with relevant um, potential partners on further developing downstream activities. And I think yeah, thank the you, US... for that response. Sorry, I was just going to say, and I think the USG truly understands that. It is part of what drives into things like the, you know, sort of in Inflation Reduction Act. Um, it also, uh, you know, sort of feeds into proposed um, you know, sort of tax credits on, on materials produced and otherwise. So um, the US government is very focused on um, reshoring a, a number of these areas. And um, when the US puts its mind to doing something, um, I think they have a very good track record. Yeah, thanks, Amanda. Sorry, just part B to that um, around uh, the pricing, because I know Paul a, a while back said that um, your SEG, you're getting only sort of 50% payability or around that number versus sort of, if you call it a benchmark within China on turbine disposal, et cetera. Um, how do you think about pricing of those heavies um, with respect to, you know, floor pricing or, or how you should price those? Um, so I think that in terms of as we think about the production which is coming out of um, uh, the Texas facility, uh, clearly the DOD will get first call and um, it will be done at commercial rates and so therefore we will capture that additional margin that you've just mentioned, Paul. Um, and then our focus is on ensuring, and, and we are working on this in terms of looking at our feedstock profile as well, if you look at an NDFEB magnet, a high performance NDFEB magnet, you basically need your DYTB at a rate of about 1 to 10 uh, to your NDPR. Um, so we need to increase the amount of uh, DYTB that we have. And what we will look to do is to work with our customers to optimise the pricing on that because it will be of great value to our customers to uh, secure not just their NDPR but also their DYTB in the right um, ratio. Okay, thanks, Amanda. Look, look forward to seeing it evolve. Cheers. Thanks, Paul. And one moment for our next question. And our next question will be coming from Al Harvey of JP Morgan. Your line is open, Al. Good morning, Amanda and team. Um, just another one on the CapEx at Calgary. Sorry, did, was there a feedback there? Um, just wanted to understand uh, CapEx guide, still $600 million for 2024, but we have had that um, increase at Kalgoorlie. So just wondering if, if there's been a shuffling um, across the other projects, um, kind of how we think about, yeah, the, the 600 mil spend across the, across the, um, the different projects. Um, so I think that uh, if you look at this, and, and Gaudens can come in as well, but we're really talking about um, often when we're talking about cash, uh, CapEx, it's really sort of what we see in terms of cash. And as I said, with some of those um, capitalised uh, pre-commissioning and commissioning costs, um, that cash has already uh, been seen um, through and so at uh, 30 June uh, in the accounts we've got 600 million um, cash out. So we 
yes, there is. I mean, I think that there's always a little bit of balancing as it turns out some of what we're doing in the lamp has cost us a bit less than we originally thought that it was going to cost us um, some other projects we haven't commenced yet um, ultimately the amount that you get to spend in a year can sometimes also be determined by your ability to actually spend so if you think about six six hundred million dollars in a year that's an awful lot of dollars every single week um, so we are confident that that is the number that we will be able to spend both based on the projects and and our ability to execute. A bit of reshuffling, but not 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 substantive. Sure, thanks, Amanda. Um, just on to lamp. Just note the the High Court's recently um, ruled to grant. Um, judicial proceedings to, to progress your licensing appeal. Just want to get a sense of what the next um, timing milestones might be there that we can look out for. Sure. So we lodged the uh, two the two judicial review applications um, the end of last month and the first uh, hearings in front of uh, judges were in um, were last week. And that's where we were given leave to a, a, a appeal. I, I think Sarah's on the call and she can add to this, but uh, no. Oh, okay, we had some problems getting Sarah connected. So I'll just um, uh, cover this myself then. So the next step is that there will be um, a hearing of sub substantive matters. And I think that that's in the first week of September, Daniel. Um, and uh, then it will move through from there. I think, as we've said previously, we're very confident about our position. We don't actually have a great appetite to be in the courts. This is something that we would much rather be, um, she's just sent me a note, directions hearing on the 3rd of September. Um, so, uh, we don't have a great appetite to be in the courts. We would rather actually deal with this um, with with the regulator and the government on a, a, a sensible um, evidence-based uh, basis. Uh, however, um, you know, we are compelled in this instance to move through this uh, judicial review process and um, we are very confident about the grounds on which we have made the application. Thanks, Amanda. And just finally on the, the Mount World capacity expansion, I just wanted to get an update on how the progress of the, the appetite processing circuit's going. Um, if you've got any update there. Um. It may be better for me to get the team to have a conversation with you separately on that. Um, yes, we are, um, uh, there are, because there are a couple of different parts associated with it. We've got one which is pre-leach, uh, which allows us to improve our recoveries post um, floating off some of the appetite. And then there's a second piece, which as we go through the ore body in um, deeper into the ore body, we, we have more appetite um, rich ore. And there's a second set of activities associated with that. But I think maybe the best thing would be to get somebody to, to take you through that in a bit more detail because um, it, it is quite complex. Sure, thanks Amanda. One moment for our next question. Our next question will be coming from Reg Spencer of Canaccord. Reg, your line is open. Uh, good morning, Amanda and team. Um, I might, thank you very much, I should start. Thank you very much with, uh, for all the detail around the CapEx. That's, that's very helpful. Um, I was wondering if I could ask a question around OPEX, uh, given inflationary pressures that we are seeing on capital. Uh, you were in a position to comment or provide some guidance or how we should think about the current cost of Kalgoorlie? Or is that something we might have to wait uh, a little bit? 
Okay, I, I, I've got a little bit of interference on there, but um, we have, actually I did sort of mention this earlier, Reg, that, that um, we do have a profile on, on the operating costs at Kalgoorlie um, and uh, it's a lot less than the first draft, which would not surprise you. Uh, as I said, we're very focused on ensuring that we keep our cost muscle, um, even with the addition of the third site. Having said that, this year when we are um, going to be running three plants and, 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 and not yet able to confidently put in the additional downstream, there will be some, some uh, cost penalties associated with that. We're not, we're, we're not going to be able to form a final view on that until we've actually got this plant up and running. It is much larger. Um, we've got headroom, all of these things sort of help to improve the efficiency of the material moving through the plant. On the other hand, we have some quite significant landside logistics penalties associated with some of the imported reagents like you know, MGO and, and, and those sorts of things. And so, um, you know, the team is currently working on what are better solutions than handling the same material three different times, you know, um, before it actually gets to the plant. And that should allow us to be able to um, get some further cost optimization in that area. But I, I don't think that we can give you good guidance on this until we've actually got the plan up and running and we see how, um, you know, and, and we start that optimization process on the costs. Understood. Thanks very much, Amanda. Um, another question would be around Malaysia. I, I know it's difficult for you to give us a timeline on when we might expect an outcome of the judicial review. But if, if I could uh, put something to you on a uh, best case scenario here, if the review was found in your favour and you were able to continue to crack and leach indefinitely in Malaysia, you've you would then have uh, well, what, like 17 or 18,000 tonnes per annum of cracking and leaching capacity. Um, under a best case scenario, you know, how might we think about uh, that review being found in your favour? Or is it this far too early for you to speculate on that? Um, under a best case scenario, yes, we have approval to continue to operate in Malaysia. Under a best case scenario, uh, we uh, then would make um, commitments and decisions related to upsizing the downstream uh, capability. And I think at the last quarterly call, Paul actually talked about, you know, we have an opportunity to consider how to revamp our SX and, and, and in particular, but also invest in further uh, product finishing capability in Malaysia, which would allow us to get an uplift in uh, capacity there, which is why we are confident about making the step to the 9,000 tonnes of Kalgoorlie, because, you know, we, we will be able to um, uplift further the downstream capacity um, at the most appropriate time. The other thing to note is that there are... Uh, that there are earth carbonate, and so we're not um, sort of concerned that we will add additional capacity. No way to sell that if we're if we're not able to process it ourselves. And of course, finally, the mixed rare earth carbonate feedstock will be going through to the US facility. So. Um, yeah, it will be a very big celebration if we have both the facilities operating. Um, and But if not, we have a variety of different pathways to ensure that we optimise the capacity which is available to us. You, you, you kind of answered my question there, Amanda, um, in, in that, you know, where would you locate further separation finishing capacity, because that would appear to be the, the bottleneck uh, relative to your cracking and leaching capacity. Um, so you're suggesting that if it went for your way, that would likely be placed subject to FID and studies and so on and so forth in, in Malaysia and not somewhere else? Um, 
it could be in Malaysia. The facility in Kalgoorlie certainly has um, all of the 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 utilities uh, and scope to be able to increase selectively the amount of you know the, the type of activities that we undertake there. Um, it is not something on which we've spent a huge amount of time as we race to meet our current deadline. You know, once we've got this part of the plan up and running, we will review that and we will compare all of the relevant locations. And then, you know, we are building a factory in, in, in Texas, which will do um, solvent extraction and product finishing, both the heavies and lights. So we, we, we do have options. And I think right back, Rich, to what I was saying at the beginning, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. And sometimes we're sort of moving the pieces around and maybe snipping off an edge here and there to make sure that they fit. Um, but we are confident that we have all of the right um, elements and just as each of these different things fall into place, most importantly, the Malaysian licence, we will make decisions on the subsequent um, <coughs> investment profile. Good. Thanks very much, Amanda. Thanks, Ray. Anyone will for our next question? Our next question will come from Reagan Burroughs of Bell Potter. Your line is open. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Amanda and team. Thanks for the time this morning. Just a couple of questions from me. I might um, might just start with a broad one, just in terms of production and sales. Um, I think on the, on the quarterly call, you sort of guided to roughly 10 to 15 percent of inventory stockpiling over the next couple of quarters. Just thinking whether your sort of um, whether your thought on this has changed, and and I guess for the full FY24, um, are we sort of to interpret I guess production sort of down and sales sort of up a little bit with that inventory volumes? I guess just how should we sort of look at it? Um. The first six months of this year has its fair share of challenges, um, Reagan, as we um, potentially transition across from, you know, to, to the Kalgoorlie facility being the primary um, feed stock for, Mal for Malaysia. Um, you know, I, I think everybody knows that there is clearly risk as we start up the facility and the speed at which that ramp up will occur. We believe that the um, level of experience that we have in operating a cracking and leaching facility will stand us in good stead. But nonetheless, um, it, it is a large and complex plant and uh, I, I think everyone would know that it would be imprudent of us not to be planning for you know, as we've described previously, various scenarios, you know, sort of a best possible and, you know, at the uh, other limit, um, you know, sort of a slow uh, ramp up. And, and you know, we, we, we have the tools to allow us to make assessments on that. So the inventory build, particularly in the six months, is to ensure that we do two things, you know, we, we don't unnecessarily sell uh, into a weak market, um, but B, we also carry inventory just in case there are unforeseen delays as, as we ramp up the facility. Um, so there is in across this financial year, clearly as we make the transition, as Reg just, Reg just said, if we get things resolved, um, uh, appropriately in Malaysia, then we've got upside. If we don't, then um, yes, it's it's likely to be uh, you know, that we will have some pressures on production, which is once again why we think that it's prudent in the industry. All right, uh, thanks for that, Amanda. Just one potentially changing tact and I guess tra tackling it from a different angle, but the, the capital expenditure at, at Kalgoorlie, I remember speaking to gut ends, there was some sort of tax, um, I guess, shields that could have been applied to that under the COVID-19 um, sort of error rules. 
just sort of curious whether you were able to sort of capitalise on, on any of those. Uh, Gaddins, do you want to take that question? Um, so I think that's, that's really specific uh, to uh, tax and uh, tax uh, uh, consideration. I think there was kind of this um, 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 uh, set up in place for, for Australia, uh, kind of uh, um, uh, COVID-related uh, that um, uh, you, you could take it, uh, advantage on kind of on the, when, when to recognize the, the, the uh, uh, tax uh, depreciation of the, of the assets, uh, kind of in, in one, uh, one go, if you could, uh, if, if they were put in 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 uh, place uh, before the end of uh, June. Uh, and um, I think we, we, we have a couple of assets, obviously, which, uh, which uh, uh, qualify. I think it's a little bit different between accounting um, approach and uh, tax approach. So we are working uh, that uh, uh, through. And uh, we will know, or we, we, we need to finalize this uh, before we obviously hand in our, our tax uh, uh, declaration before the end of this uh, 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 calendar year. But I think here it's, it's, it's not uh, uh, p and impact, it's really more cash impact on uh, when you pay the uh, taxes. So if you, if you can uh, kind of pull forward the tax shield um, um, uh, uh, at, uh, at this point in time, or if you spread it over the uh, the, the life of the uh, uh, assets, so that's that's the only impact. It's it's purely a timing impact. All right, th thanks for that. That ends. Potentially, just one more, if I could squeeze in, just in terms of the nine thousand ton uh, capacity increase. Just confirming that's nine thousand tons of separated NDTR. So I guess from an M rate. Yeah product perspective, we should think of that as roughly 15,000 tonnes um, capacity. Uh, um, we can confirm that at some other stage, Reagan, but yes, we, we think about the capacity in terms of finished product. Yeah. Okay. So it is the equivalent to the there. finished Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you. One moment for our next question. And our next question will be coming from Daniel Morgan. Uh, Baron Joy, your line's open. I thank you, Amanda and Tim. Uh, in the releases, you talk about scope of 9,000 tonne per annum of NDPR at Kalgoorlie. Um, but this compares to back in 2019 when you announced Linus 2025. Uh, that you were targeting 10,500 tonnes per annum of NDPR. Is the gap between them, is that proposed to be the US plant? Is there going to be a cracking and leaching circuit there? Or, you know, what is the difference between those numbers? Thank you. No, no, sorry, the 9,000 is what we will now be able to crack at Kalgoorlie. So it is higher. And so the 10,500. Sorry. Where are we going oh, to get I was referring to... Sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, apologies, uh, I keep interrupting. Um, I, I, in 2019, Linus 2025, I think you announced that you would build system capacity of 10,500 tonnes per annum of NDPR. Hmm. Yes. And all the way back then, there was no... At that stage, we did not face any um, constraints on continuing to operate cracking in Malaysia. So the first change to the licence in Malaysia, which saw us not a, you know, which, which was in, um, was foreshadowed in August 2019 and that, Linus 2025 is, I think, May 2019. Um, but the licence didn't actually change until March 2020. So right back when we said that 10 and a half, we were working on a different set of assumptions in terms of what we had. And in fact, 
um, all the way back then, I think we were thinking about, you know, sort of uh, nameplate capacity at, at Carville in the first instance of maybe about three and a half, four thousand 4,000 tonnes. So then we got the change to the licence and that's when your know, grant and team had to go back and really rethink what were we doing at Kalgoorlie, how were we sizing it and how were we going to be able to um, ensure that it, it met our requirements um, in the medium and long term. And that's when we then changed sort of the first goal there was to at a minimum be up to replace Malaysia, bearing in mind that, you know, by now we were on a, 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 a two and a half year sort of ticking timeline. Um, but as we've moved through and as indicated in previous disclosures, we've made the additional investments to give us confidence in being able to get this 9,000 tonnes. Now, you're right, and a number of you have highlighted that that's still not at the 10 and a half and not at the 12 that we're actually putting in place in Mount World. But we still have, um, you know, some way to go in terms of our discussions in Malaysia. Cracking will not be uh, a bottleneck if we can get this um, result appropriately in Malaysia. But, you know, I mean, there's been a number of things have moved through this sort of four year period. And what we've been trying to do is to ensure that as we make our investments, we give ourselves optionality so that still by 2025, we have at least 10 and a half and hopefully 12,000 um, tonnes of NEPR capacity. Okay, thank you. I might leave it there in the interest of time. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Daniel. One moment for our next question. Okay. And our last question will come from Paul Young of Goldman Sachs. Your line is open, Paul. Hi again, Amanda. Just a few follow-ups on the on the U.S. refinery, uh, please. Um, first, just on the on the heavy earth refinery. When do you expect to award EPCM contracts and actually start construction? Um, so uh, we have um, we have all already identified uh, an, an EPCM partner with whom we've been working for some time. Um, in fact, in the next, they've been to Kwantan on at least one occasion and. Um, are there again um, in the next couple of weeks for a two-week um, period because we have a number of our Malaysian engineers who will also engage in um, on this project. Um, so that's the you know, sort of the first point. Yes, we've identified an EPCM partner and also a construction firm. The second piece is that uh, we have started with the NEPA approval process and that's going to determine um, when we're able to commence construction. Okay, thanks Amanda. And then just a second one on the light earth refinery. Um, um, what is the what is the latest, what is the, the last capital estimate for the 5,000 and, and are you, do you expect to update that, that estimate? Um, we, we are finalising, is, is, is interesting with always when you deal with gov dealing with government. So there is one contracting body for the heavies and a second contracting body for the lights. Um, we we um, are finalising um, contract discussions with the um, entity that is the contracting entity for the lights and um, we would expect to be updating what well, we would update that once once those um, negotiations are complete. Okay, and that, that, that would be an FY24? Oh, yes. Okay, great. Okay, thank you, Amanda. Appreciate it. Thanks, Paul. Thanks. And I would now like to hand the conference back to Amanda for closing remarks. Okay, so once again, thank you all. Um, it's, as I said, uh, 
we live in, 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 in interesting times and we at Liners are very pleased that we've been able to um, meet many of our challenges and uh, I look forward to being able to um, uh, take you all on either a, a, an in-person or a virtual tour of our fabulous new facility at Kalgoorlie because um, it really is very impressive. Um, we face the future with enthusiasm and optimism, but those of you who know me would know that I uh, face everything with enthusiasm and optimism. Um, but I think that we remain um, in the best place to really be match fit to take full advantage of the growth in this market. So thanks, and I'll look forward to seeing many of you over the next few days.